you're watching HD Live, the streaming video service of Health Day News. I'm Mabel Jong. More than 300,000 and counting, that's the number of deaths in the United States this year from COVID-19 since the first coronavirus case was confirmed in January. Since that first case, scientists have learned a lot about how the virus spreads, how to avoid infection, who is most at risk for serious illness, and how to manage patients better. Clearly, we've come a long way, but perhaps not far enough. Joining me now is Dr. David Shulkin, who served as Secretary of Veterans Affairs under President Trump and also worked for President Obama. And also joining me is Dr. Joel Zivit, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Surgery at Emory University. He also works at Emory Decatur Hospital's Intensive Care Unit, where he treats COVID-19 patients. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shulkin, let's start with you. When we spoke last April, you said that the United States missed the boat to contain this virus. Was the unfolding of events these past months worse than you imagined? And how will that impact the U.S. going into the future? Yeah, I think, Mabel, it's often hard to look back and to, and to criticize what's happened. But uh, in April, it was pretty clear that we were already starting from behind. We had a failed biosurveillance effort to be able to detect that the virus was here in the United States already. So we started off rather behind the ball and we were not prepared on the testing front. So therefore we were just simply unable to be able to keep up and to isolate and identify where this virus was spreading. In April, as you recall, we had selected parts of the United States with very severe outbreaks, mostly in the Northeast, but some isolated parts in Arizona, Florida, and other states as well. But now, as we are in December, we're looking at widespread escalation of the virus, the uh, you know, simply growth in the pandemic in numbers that are 10 to 15 fold what we saw back in April. So I do think that this handling of the pandemic has continued to be uh, worse than I think almost anybody had anticipated. Without the good news of the vaccines now on scene, which I know we're gonna talk about, this really would be a rather depressing time. Mm -hmm. But this is a very uh, interesting time right now where we have so many people suffering, so many people dying, no real uh, evidence that the infection is slowing, yet the optimism of actually watching this vaccine being administered and knowing that it's a matter of time before we can get this under control. Now, Dr. Zivit, over to you. You treat patients in the ICU. What is it like in the hospital now compared to what you saw in the pandemic's earliest days? I was recalling the first, my very first COVID-19 patient. I think it was in, in March. And I work at Emory University and, and my university and hospital system has a lot of experience caring for very sick patients with communicable diseases. Emory uh, distinguished itself by caring for the first Ebola patients. So we had experience with this sort of thing. But I remember the very first patient, uh, we had one patient and uh, we got into our papper and went into the room and saw the patient. <clears throat> and uh, I remember that we came out and then I got a call from uh, another hospital saying we have a second patient. And so I, I called to arrange for the second patient to be transferred and I was told, well, we can't accommodate a second patient. So I thought, hmm, okay, well, we are going to be in trouble. We've got to step up a little bit. Um, but of course, very rapidly we, we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in the time we've learned a lot, I think we've worked together, we've come together. I, I think that even the experience of intensive care for most people, even many physicians is something that they're not familiar with. And now of course, intensive care is everywhere. And I think that we have risen to the occasion to the extent that we can. Um, we're stretched thinly, we, we are, it's difficult and challenging, but we've learned a lot and uh, we've uh, helped people survive. And, and for that, I think even just for us to, to know that people could survive COVID, that was a huge, um, a huge thing to recognize. Well, how have you gotten better at treating these patients? What are you doing that's different today than what you did before? Well, I, I think that um, 
First of all, there's been, of course, some effective research that has sh shown some pharmaceutical interventions to have some benefit. We've learned some, we've brought to bear some basic principles of critical care and caring for these patients. We figured out how to uh, don and doff uh, our PPE, how to wear masks. We've figured out how to do that. Of course, it's been difficult, but we figured it out. Um, and I think we do a good job supporting each other. Uh, I think our institution has been uh, very mindful to keep track of us to the extent that it's possible to do so. Um, I think that it, and it, it really was, I think, a moment where we realized that with just good critical care, good nursing care, good supportive care, that many of these patients could actually survive. Truthfully, in the beginning, the, the, the wonder was, would all of these patients just die? And, and so to be able to know that they could, and also to know that you might have to, to dig in for the long game therapeutically. I think that these patients are sick for a long time, the sickest ones. And even though they're sick for a long time, you know, many of them can still, can still survive. And so that I think is, is heartening. Uh, Dr. Shulkin, you mentioned the vaccines, two vaccines authorized for emergency use, quite an incredible feat for vaccine development. Yet according to AMA President Susan Bailey, the biggest threat may be people's unwillingness to get vaccinated. How should we approach this? How should this be addressed when people say they don't want to get that shot? I think that there's always been a certain percent of the population that has had vaccine hesitancy, the anti-vaxxers that we've heard about. And I think it's going to be very challenging to change their opinions about vaccines. But what we've seen in the recent public opinion polls is a much higher level of vaccine hesitancy that I believe is a result of what's happened over this past year with the lack of public confidence in our scientific institutions and the questioning of science in general by some of our politicians. And so I think that the only way to address that is to uh, reinforce with transparency what the data shows and to make sure that we don't make any missteps or, or shortcuts in this. I think the FDA is uh, doing a very good job right now now of making sure that it's being cautious, that it is sharing the data, it, it is getting outside experts to weigh in on this. And I think the data that we've seen on these two mRNA vaccines has been very reassuring, very high effectiveness rates of the 95% level, very low levels of adverse events, and the safety data that we have so far seems encouraging. So I think that as time goes on, as we now administered several hundred thousand of these vaccines with relatively few adverse effects, a few minor uh, adverse events being reported, people are going to get more comfortable with this and we're gonna see the level of uh, hesitancy go down. And I think that the majority of Americans will choose to get this vaccine. Okay, uh, now there may be a shortage of vaccines, so priorities are being set. Dr. Zivit, you got your shot um, recently, and frontline workers in general are going to be at the front of the queue. Do you agree with that? Do you think that we should be using our supply first for the workers who do work with uh, COVID patients? Well, you know, Mabel, this is a very, uh, it's an important question, and I want to first of all start by saying that I I think that while I understand the idea of using the metaphor of war and the front line, why that is appealing, that may be one of the problems here. I think that in the metaphor of war, we imagine a front line that pits two implacable foes against each other with intention. I think that COVID-19 is caused by a virus that has no particular intention or agenda. And so by framing this as a war and by claiming that the front line is the hospital, there may be some problems there because truthfully to my mind, the front line is really everywhere. And that I think is the problem. Arguably the healthcare worker in the hospital is better protected uh, than a person on the street. And so I think we just needed to decide what exactly our priorities are in these early days when the vaccine is in short supply. 
Do we want to interrupt transmission or do we want to save lives? Mm -hmm. And I understand that a grateful public feels that it wants to support healthcare workers. And I, I'm, I appreciate that. I'm also have gratitude to be in this position and care for people. Mm -hmm. But I think that what we didn't really do to my mind is really decide exactly from a policy perspective, what exactly these priorities were in the beginning. To my mind, what will unclog the hospital will be to, to vaccinate patients or people who I know will end up as my patients. If the hospital is less full, it will be much easier to do our job in every respect. What makes our job difficult is scale, is the fact that the ICUs are full and that supplies are then therefore are short. So by simply reducing the number of patients, that I think will have an enormous impact on the way that we are able to care for patients in our experience. Um, Dr. Shulkin, we, we talked a lot about um, these healthcare professionals who we still refer to as working on, on the front line um, and possibly suffering from something that soldiers do suffer from when they are in battle. Uh, PTSD. Uh, do you feel that this is still um, something that will come up for our healthcare workers in the days ahead, since they have seen so much and have had to do so much from their from where they work? I think there's no doubt that this is one of the long-term consequences that is going to result from this pandemic. I think healthcare in general is going to be changed forever. Uh, the healthcare professionals themselves, as well as the patients in terms of how they're going to want to get care in the future. But when it comes to our healthcare professionals, we are seeing that there's a tremendous toll, both emotional and physical, on our healthcare workers. We're seeing, I think, one of the reasons why healthcare professionals were prioritized in the vaccination rate is because our hospitals in some cases are running out of room, but many more cases running out of staff and staff are getting burned out, staff are getting sick themselves and many experiencing emotional um, impacts of this pandemic. And therefore uh, we're seeing higher levels of retirements and people just leaving the profession. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you're a hospital CEO, as I have been almost all my career, you understand that your greatest asset are your staff and you've got to take care of them and you have to make sure that you're doing the things to support them so they can in turn support the patients that they care for. And one of those things we've all learned during this pandemic is, is that it is about emotional health as well as physical health. And so um, uh, I think that we're just beginning now to understand this interconnection between the behavioral healthcare system and the physical healthcare system. And now on top of that, there's evidence that the virus has mutated and is becoming more contagious. Uh, London, for instance, is in total lockdown, cut adrift due to the appearance of a new mutant coronavirus strain there. First of all, Dr. Shulkin, can you explain how this strain found its way to the UK? Yeah, well, uh, coronaviruses in general, which COVID is one of them, are known to mutate as most viruses do. There have been over 12,000 documented mutations of the COVID virus already. We've seen these mutations um, uh, throughout Europe and the United States. This recent one reported over the weekend appears to be a little bit more transmissible which is why it has such concern over in the United Kingdom. Uh, but I have no doubt it's already here in the United States. Uh, one of the things that we know is, is that with the global economy, there is no ability to stop these things going between countries' borders. So I suspect that we will see more of that here in the United States. I don't think it's a particular cause for alarm. I suspect that the vaccines will be effective against this type of variant as well. There appears to be no significant difference in clinical severity. So I think that this is just a fact that viruses do mutate, but it speaks to the point that we're gonna to have to remain very uh, vigilant about biosurveillance in the future because a virus theoretically could mutate and probably will try to mutate uh, to become more virulent, to become more severe, and potentially even to make a vaccine ineffective in the future, the way that we've seen in past years with the influenza vaccine. Okay, and Dr. Zivit, since you are on the ground at your hospital, is 
the hospital system, do you believe, prepared for this strain that is possibly, is possibly already here in the United States? I think what we don't yet know is whether this, the, the, what's at issue is, is, um, is how contagious this version of the virus is versus how virulent this virus, uh, this, this, this form of the virus might be. It may be that, that people who are infected uh, with this strain suffer the same natural course of COVID. So I, I, I don't know whether or not these patients will be sicker and harder to treat. I think that remains an open question. I think that uh, we are we are as prepared as we can be. You know, we are we are doing what we can. I, I certainly would be here to advocate um, and reinforce the role of non-pharmacological interventions like social distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing. That these things have been shown, um, you know, both in modeling and in peer or and by experience to reduce transmission. These are not fancy things. They're not expensive things um, in the moment, but they are bothersome and, and, and difficult things. But now is the time in particular, I think, where we need to be certain that we're doing all of those kinds of things so we can reduce the rapidity of spread. The hospital can manage it when the spread is not like a mass casualty event. When it comes at a certain kind of pace, we can keep up. It's when it's suddenly everywhere all at once that it becomes challenging. Dr. Joel Zivit of Emory University Hospital, Dr. David Shulkin, former Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm Mabel Jones.